Une lecture de l'Évangile de Luc. Lorsque le temps approcha où Jésus devait être enlevé de ce monde, il décéda de manière résolue de se rendre à Jérusalem. Il envoya devant lui des messagers. En cours de route, ils entrèrent dans un village de la Samarie pour lui préparer un logement. Mais les Samaritains lui refusaient l'hospitalité parce qu'il se rendait à Jérusalem. En voyant cela, ses disciples, Jacques et Jean, s'écrièrent, « Seigneur, veux-tu que nous commandions à la foudre de tomber du ciel sur ces gens-là pour les réduire en cendres? » Mais Jésus, se tournant vers eux, les reprit sévèrement, « Vous ne savez pas quel esprit vous inspire de telles pensées. Le Fils de l'homme n'est pas venu pour faire mourir les hommes, mais pour les sauver. » Acclamons la parole de Dieu. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Freedom is one of the most controversial words in public space today. It seems rather ironic that everyone wants freedom, but nobody quite agrees on what it actually is. But for freedom, Christ has set us free. So that kind of seems completely redundant, doesn't it? <clears throat> so what else would it be for other than freedom for which Christ sets us free? But that redundancy is built in there by Paul intentionally for its effect. If there is such a thing as freedom, then there must be such a thing as unfreedom. So what did unfreedom look like back in Paul's time, and what does it look like in our time today? Well, in Paul's letters, we see he had three unfreedoms in mind, at least three that, uh, that I see. Maybe he had more. He had the unfreedom of living under Roman dictatorship. He had the unfreedom of living under the rules and regulations of Jewish oral law. Now, let me just say, the Torah, the, the uh, law of the Hebrew scriptures, was given by God to be a delight. And that's what, Paul, uh, what David says in the Psalms. Your, your law, O Lord, is a delight to me. But what happened over time was an accumulation of oral interpretations that just kind of collected, built, built this collective body of rules that were deeply constricting on people's lives, which was not God's original intention. And so political oppression and excessive rules were the first two unfreedoms that Paul had in mind. Now for the third unfreedom that concerns Paul, which he mentions in Galatians 5.13 this morning that we just heard read. Self-indulgence. Self-indulgence. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, he says. <clears throat> so, of Paul's three unfreedoms, I would say that self-indulgence is the one most relevant to us in our time and context today. We tend to think of self-indulgence as freedom for. Freedom for doing what we like. But we need to recall that freedom always has two sides. Freedom from something, freedom for something else. So self-indulgence can be described as freedom from constraints, freedom for doing whatever we want. So we have a term for this today. Among those who uh, think and write on uh, these these things, the term that's commonly used today is libertarian freedom. And it's this libertarian interpretation of freedom that pervades our society today. That freedom is a, ha a matter of having no constraints or as few constraints on us as possible. And, but this is not just kind of a view of our time. This is an ancient view. This is a view kind of, of what freedom is about that can be found through probably any period of, of, of history, though it's certainly 
at various times has places where it is more pronounced, more influential. In effect, Paul is saying that self-indulgence, or let's say libertarian freedom, is actually an unfreedom. And this is because freedom to do whatever we want can actually cause harms to us and to others that we don't see. So, for instance, I would argue libertarian freedom produces consumerism, produces less safe air versions of capitalism, produces unfettered pollution, produces sexual license, and ultimately produces nihilism and anxious societies. So for Paul, if freedom is not for self-indulgence, then what is freedom for? And the answer is also found in verse 13. And the answer is deeply counterintuitive to us today who are immersed in the waters of our libertarian culture today. On Paul's account, what freedom is for is to become servants of one another. Sounds kind of strange to our ears today. The, word, the Greek word Paul uses here is doulos. So this is a word that has a broad scope of meaning. It can include at one end uh, our, our word servant, but it can also include slavery, to be a slave. To be a, a, a doulos also is the standard word for slave back in the day. The word slave, of course, carries meanings of abuse and exploitation that the word servant does not. And so I think a better translation is those translations that use the word servant rather than the word slave. So become servants to one another. Let's call this freedom for service. Freedom for service. So, now, the philosophers of libertarian uh, freedom do put an important qualification or restriction uh, on libertarian freedom. On their version, freedom is to do as we choose so long as our choices or our freedoms don't interfere with the equivalent freedoms of others. You get that? I'll, I'll say that again. So here's the qualification. On libertarian freedom, we can choose to do as we wish so long as our actions or freedoms do not interfere with the equivalent freedoms of others. Now, that's an important qualification, but I think it still has two problems. First, it does not give any priority to serving others as a basis of understanding what freedom is about. One may care for or serve others if one so chooses on that account, but this remains optional. Secondly, society at large forgets that qualification. Right? <clears throat> One, uh, so people at large often just don't bother to look out for how their own freedoms or actions are, may be harming others. It's not on their radar. How might my actions actually be limiting the freedoms of others? So people at large often have limited concern for how their actions might actually harm others. Christian faith is realistic about freedom. Freedom always exists within constraints. For example, the freedom to drive your car as fast as you want in those places that don't have speed limits on their highways, like Germany or some, there's some state in the northern U.S. that has no speed limits on its highways, that freedom to drive as fast as you want is not an absolute freedom. There are constraints. There are constraints on the amount of fuel in, your, in your, your gas tank, on the power of your engine, on the uh, barriers or you may r crash into if you lose control. There are always constraints on anything. It is humanly impossible not to have constraints in life. Rather than seeking to escape constraints as much as possible, I would suggest we need to discern which constraints are indeed harmful, because many are, and which constraints 
are actually freeing constraints, actually free us. That's right, in life, there are both harmful constraints and freeing constraints, but it's the reality of freeing constraints that our society rarely, if ever, talks about. Let me give three examples of what I mean by this. So the first example of what I'm calling a freeing constraint. Some time ago, I read about a, um, a, an account of a children's league soccer game in which the referee was late. So they waited and waited, and so eventually the children just started playing the game on their own without a referee present. But soon the game just became a free-for-all. So that many of the children just became frustrated and gave up, gave up playing. Enjoyment of the game was not possible under such free-for-all conditions. Yet once the referee arrived and imposed a few basic rules, all the children knew the parameters within which to play together, and so their enjoyment returned, and they returned to the game. These rules are freeing constraints, structured constraints that freed the children to experience the pleasure they were seeking in the game. So in effect, a balance between too few rules and too many rules was what's needed for, to, for the objective, simply for the kids to uh, enjoy the game. That's one example. A second example here, very different. This example comes from Dorothy Day. Some of you may know Dorothy Day as a co-founder of the Catholic Workers Movement in the 1930s. Now, as a young woman, she was very active in, uh, in, in social activist um, uh, programs, especially uh, in workers' uh, um, activism, traveling extensively across the USA, very involved in politics and the labor movement. Eventually, she gave birth to her daughter, Tamar, which meant that suddenly, Day had a new responsibility to care and provide for this child, for her daughter, with limited support, very limited support from her mostly uninvolved, uh, from the child's mostly uninvolved father. She describes the constraint that having a daughter placed on her. She writes this, I was enchained, tied to one spot, no longer able to pick up and travel from one part of the country to another, from one job to another. No matter how much I might sometimes wish to flee from my new quiet existence, I could not, nor would I be able to for several years. So that's the constraint side. What was Day's response to that, this constraint of her, her infant daughter? Well, she goes on to say this, I had to accept my suddenly quiet and still life. And accepting it, I rejoiced in it. Okay, that seems odd. Why would she rejoice in this constraint? Because in her daughter, Day discovered joy, a freedom of the heart, which her earlier freedoms had not given her. And she carries on to say, I had thought that through all those years, I had had freedom. But now I felt I had never known real freedom or even had the knowledge what freedom even meant. In effect, her daughter became a freeing constraint. Let me just give you one more example because uh, this is such an important principle that I think many of our discussions in society today miss. This example comes from the world of music. So there's a well-known musician, theologian named Jeremy Begbie, and he observes, he makes these comments. There are, of course, many constraints that do undermine human freedom. And he lists a few, just randomly, such as epilepsy, or terminal cancer, or solitary confinement, and countless others. Nonetheless, Jeremy goes on to, uh, <coughs> Jeremy goes on to contend that we need to challenge the belief that we automatically increase freedom by reducing limits or by multiplying the options open to us. So he makes a couple observations. He, he, uh, he asks, how does it increase our freedom to have 30 brands of yogurt we can choose from? But then he goes on to more substantially say in this example, in music, this principle of freeing constraints is seen nowhere more clearly than in improvised music. For a blues pianist, for example, the standard chord pattern enables elaboration. Structure enables freedom. 
Jazz pianist David Sudnow's breakthrough into jazz came as he learned to trust his hands to explore their own relation to the physical peculiarities of the keyboard. In other words, he started to respect and trust the constraints. His body, his instrument, the properties of sound. These constraints were not impediments to his freedom to be shunned, but the means to discovering and realizing his musical freedom. I think these three examples of freeing constraints provide an important element to understanding the nature of freedom. Let me quote here from, uh, well, let, just before I, I read this quote, <clears throat> let me just say that um, I believe discussion of freedom in our society today is, is usually missing this point, which I'm, I said earlier, that while many constraints are indeed harmful, others are freeing, and we need to discern between them, not just throw all constraints under the bus. Let me quote now from uh, Yale law professor Stephen Carter. He makes this point by way of sex and money. Let's talk about sex and money. It is the unhappy moral burden of our politics today that nobody seems to be concerned with the limits to freedom. Liberals refuse to accept the idea that sexual freedom has limits or, for that matter, consequences. Conservatives refuse to accept the idea that there are any limits on how much money one should have or what one should do with it. As the theologian Stanley Hauerwas has pointed out, the contemporary liberal emphasis on the radical autonomy of the individual to make whatever choices they want about sex has made it impossible for liberals to articulate a persuasive program to restrict the autonomy of the wealthy to make the choices they want about how to accumulate and spend their money. Or vice versa. The price of Bob's freedom to sleep with whomever he likes whenever he likes is evidently Jane's freedom to do with her wealth whatever she likes whenever she likes. Each wants to restrict the preferences and freedoms of the other without having to restrict their own preferences and freedoms. After all, uh, and all this because we no longer remember what freedom is for. Ouch. Everyone on the spectrum gets hammered there by, by Carter. So let's read it. Carter's reading of our cultural situation today, one with which I am sympathetic. So... Now let's return to Galatians, chapter 5, that we, did, we heard read earlier. Paul says to his readers in verse 1, You were called by God to freedom. That's wonderful. That's great news. Now the question is, what sort of freedom are we called to? Is God calling us to? Well, if our situation is one of political oppression, such by the, as by the Romans, then freedom from such oppression. What's interesting is Paul and libertarians can agree on that. There's common ground. Or if our situation is one of excessive, burdensome rules, then freedom from excessive rules and expectations. Again, there's common ground. But if our situation is one of unconstrained libertarian freedom, then freedom from the unseen or undiscussed harms of libertarian freedom. So what then is the primary good in Paul's view? As we've already seen in Galatians 5.13, it is using our freedom to serve others. Using our freedom to serve others. Self-giving to serve others is not an additional option. On Paul's account, self-giving to serve others is the foundational feature of the form of freedom through which we, as humanity, find our greatest flourishing. As counterintuitive as this may seem for us today, choosing the sacrifices needed to serve others brings us true freedom. Let me add a couple quotes here. One more from Carter. The idea that we should use our freedom to the common good, rather than to seek our own pleasure, has always been an idea so fragile if not carefully nurtured, we'll certainly die. We need to nurture that principle, that idea. I like this from Toni Morrison as well. Function of freedom is to free someone else. That's how you're serving. Function of freedom is to free someone else. So again, looking outwards. Now for some final comments. 
None of this means that you don't pay attention to your own needs. Of course we are to pay attention to our own wellness. For starters, we, we can't serve God, or we can't serve others, God or others. If we're not healthy ourselves, God is not calling us to burn ourselves out in the process of serving. Nor does freedom as serving deny our own self-worth by importing some unhealthy sense that others are inherently more important to me, important, are inherently more important than me. That's also not what Paul is saying here. Both of these would be uh, false implications of what Paul is saying to say that we don't look after our own wellness or that we somehow see ourselves as inferior to others and therefore have to focus only on others. Those would be distortions of what Paul is saying. Nor does freedom of service mean that we abandon our responsibilities. Many years ago, uh, my parents knew uh, a man that felt call, called by God to be a missionary in Haiti. So he explored this, and uh, his wife decided, no, uh, this is not what I think that we are called to as a family. So this fellow abandoned his family and moved to Haiti anyways. Now that's just messed up. So abandoning responsibilities is also not the freedom to which God is calling us. There is a dynamic between individual self-care and responsibilities on the one hand and stretching ourselves into self-sacrificial service towards God and others on the other. This dynamic cannot be defined by some kind of mathematical algorithm, can't be defined by some plus-minus rating of how right or wrong we're getting the balance. Rather, figuring out this dynamic, this relationship, is a lifelong process of learning, discernment, maturation, undertaken with feedback from others on the same journey, including others who have learned some wisdom along the way. So let me conclude with an invitation, and then I'll, uh, I'll open the floor for some discussion of time and uh, the tech team will make a mic available for us for that. So let me conclude with an invitation, and the invitation is this. To discover what freedom means and looks like when we look at it through the lens of Galatians 5.13, of using our freedom to serve God and others. Amen. So that's what I want to say this morning, and... We'll now open the floor for any thoughts, conversation, discussion.